Chapter 15 Mistral held station at 900 feet in calm winds, just below the cloud ceiling. Her captain stood leaning on the rail between the new breath gun and the old. She looked down on General Hinkle, mounted on his white mare and parading in front of the thin Garnian line. The general's speech was inaudible to the crew of the Mistral, drowned by distance and the unceasing whine of the ship's steamjack turbine. It was, Josette reflected, probably lost on the men in the line as well. Why parade in front of the line, giving a long speech that any man can only hear a few seconds of? she asked. Burnett looked down and said, You're missing the point. The men may only hear him for a few seconds, but he hears himself the entire time. She looked through her spyglass at the Vins, assembling by battalion on the other side of the boggy field. The first elements of the Garnian army had arrived a day ahead of them, and had immediately set themselves to improving their position. Fearin meant to create a killing ground by burning out the vegetation for two hundred paces on the other side of a little stream that cut across the fens. But the brush there was too deep to take a flame. The men, already tired by their forced march from Arl, had to spend the entire day cutting and uprooting shrubs. By sunset, with the skin of their hands rubbed raw, they'd cleared only fifty paces in front of the stream. And their ordeal had not been over. With the Vin horde due in the morning, they and every subsequent regiment had gone to work building earthworks. They dug entrenchments on the near side of the stream, shoveling and packing the dirt into a wall in front. No regiment, no matter how late it arrived, was allowed to retire for the night until they'd built their earthen wall to shoulder height. Still, it would have been well worth the effort, if not for the rain that began around four in the morning. The downpour sweeping in from Lake Magdalene washed hours of hard work right into the stream. By daybreak, when the airships arrived, the only defensive works still standing were the lumber and gabin reinforced walls constructed by army engineers to protect the artillery batteries. But while the Guardian infantrymen now stood completely exposed, envying their comrades in the artillery, they could at least take consolation in the condition of the field. The rain had turned the already muddy terrain into a slurry of boots-sucking muck, which the Vins would have to cross under fire. "'What do you suppose he's saying?' Josette asked. Below, General Fearon's horse had become mired in the mud for the third time, since the speech began. Burnett thought for a moment, then spoke in a passable impression of his uncle. Hum, hum. Men, I know you're worried, but you have nothing to fear. For let me reassure you, the moment the fighting starts, I will take my mustache safely behind the line, there to be guarded by ten stout sergeants, each with a halberd in one hand and a tin of wax in the other. Hurumph, hurumph. Josette put her hand over her heart and said, I feel better already. So, what are our chances? Josette assessed the battlefield for the tenth time in as many minutes. Then she looked southwest to the village of Canard, its wide dirt streets packed with supply and artillery wagons coming from Arles. Guardian infantry regiments were still trickling in along the road. I'll say one thing for General Fearon, she said. He has a talent for finding a beautiful piece of ground and compelling the Vins to fight him on it. She pointed to the fields around Canard, behind the Garnian line. If the Vins try to outflank us, Fearon can pull back and redeploy across solid ground, while they're still slogging through the bogs out there. So wherever they go, he'll be waiting for them and already dug in. And with more of our soldiers arriving from Arl every hour, the Vins must either attack now on Fearon's terms, or turn around and go home. Burnett said, Yes, yes, but do we have a chance? Josette ran her eyes across the thin defensive line below. 
than the 70,000 strong Vin army massing across the field. I never liked Arl that much anyway, she said. Ah, Burnett said, and sighed. General Fearon finished his speech and returned to his staff tent. Josette clapped her hands together. All right, everyone, the inspiring speech is over. Back to work. Crewmen had been sitting on the breff guns, or nibbling hardtack, suddenly leapt to their posts. Captain, said Luke Lupien at the rudder, what if I don't feel inspired yet? Josette eyed him and said, I anticipated that eventuality, Corporal and I've made a particular effort to be inspired enough for the both of us. Lupien smirked, but kept his eyes forward. Awfully thoughtful of you, Captain. Message coming in, Kimber said, her voice throaty, the words rattling in her mouth. She was stationed on the starboard rail to observe messages flashed by quicklime lamp from the staff tent. To St. Camille Militia, left flank, withdraw your three leftmost companies to 100 paces, and form a reserve column. To 83rd Fusiliers arriving, fill line and form reserve to left of St. Camille Militia. Relay it, Josette said to the crewman posted on the port railing. He pointed his quick line signal lamp and flashed the messages to their recipients. Pray tell, Burnett said. Why are the militia regiments not given numbers like the regulars? Josette considered this, then said, I suppose they'd give them numbers if militia officers knew how to count. With the arrival of the 83rd, about half the Guardian line was now regular army regiments, and the other half militiamen. Some militia regiments, those whose aristocratic sponsors could afford the expense, wore the standard Guardian uniform, a blue vest and jacket with brown trousers. It made them look almost like real soldiers. Other militiamen wore rough, undyed uniforms, and the worst of them wore no uniform at all, but only their own tattered farmer's clothes. Regardless of dress, all any of them could do was wait until the Vins attacked. In the meantime, the Garnian artillery positions tried an occasional shot at extreme range, and Mistral reported on its lack of effect. And every quarter of an hour, Josette fired off a white flare to keep the other airships of the squadron on station. There were four of them, hidden above the cloud ceiling in a line astern of Mistral. Closest in line were the one-gun chasseur Lapwing and the two-gun Ibis, whose captain commanded the squadron. Next was a lightly armed, semi-rigid scout ship, the Grouse. In the rear guard were a pair of Inauspicious blimps, too insignificant to merit formal names, but unofficially dubbed the Swamp Hen and the Nowhere Express. The poor blimps didn't even merit the expense of luft gas. They were buoyed by inflammable air, which the merest spark might set off. Mistral, in the vanguard position, was the only ship yet revealed to the enemy. She hung stationary and exposed above the infantry, there to relay messages, report enemy movements, and inspire the troops by her presence. The custom was to rotate the ships of the squadron into and out of this vulnerable position so as to share the risk of enemy artillery equally. In this case, however, orders had come directly from the general, ordering Mistral to hold the station until given further instructions, which would arrive shortly. That had been an hour ago, and no further instructions had yet arrived. At nine in the morning, the sun broke out over Lake Magdalene, 30 miles away, but the cloud ceiling above the battlefield stubbornly refused to disperse. As the sun climbed somewhere behind them, the clouds glowed with a diffuse red-orange light that seemed more gloomy somehow than the murky dawn preceding it. The air had calmed to perfect stillness. The battlefield, cast in that strange orange light, had the surreal quality of a dream. More than once, Burnett tried to wake himself up while he watched the Vins unlimbering their artillery. And then it began to rain fire, and he knew he was awake, 
for he'd never had a nightmare that could produce the stomach-tightening dread of shells exploding on every side. The Guardian cannons replied, but their fire passed over the Grand Battery to fall scattershot into the Vin Infantry's assembly area. Indeed, the cannons on each side seemed entirely uninterested in shooting at each other, but directed most of their fire at the enemy infantry. While he contemplated what seemed a strange kind of professional courtesy, a shell exploded directly to starboard, sending smoking red-hot fragments so close he heard them hiss as they sailed past. Enemy in sight, Kember called. As Burnett was wondering how she'd managed to miss them until now, the ensign reported, Looks like a shell, sir. Dead ahead. Just breaking cloud cover. That'll be our counterpart, Josette said. A shell exploded above, and she had to raise her voice over the noise. How do you say good luck in Vin? Burnett spelled it out, and Kember sent the message by signal lamp. He turned to Josette and said, I thought you were of a mind to sweep these Vin bastards from our lands, kill them to a man, make them pay for what they've done, obliterate them, eviscerate them, and etc. She shrugged. I am, but there's no reason to be impolite about it. So, is it personal? She didn't answer. Message from the Vin shall sir, Kember said. She spelled it out for Burnett. He frowned. They say, Good luck. I'm looking forward to killing you. Love, Dimitri. Huh. Not a very sentimental people, the Vins. The fresh flight of cannonballs hit the Garnian line, leaving man-wide gaps in it. A blast above made Burnett jump, and soon several crewmen in the keel were shouting, Fire! Form a party and put it out, Josette said, firmly and calmly. Burnett felt his guts twist even tighter. He looked up, hearing crewmen climb through the girders. Whereas Josette stood watching the enemy lines, stone-faced, not bothering to inquire about the damage, as if a little thing like a fire was nothing to worry about. Soon Jutes called down. Fire's out, Captain. Some damage to the envelope. A few small holes in bags six and seven. Very good, Josette said. Continue repairs. Shouldn't we at least make ourselves a moving target? Burnett asked. Our orders are to keep station. Lovely. Kemper lowered her telescope. The Vins are forming columns of division. Six battalions up front and more following behind. Big sons of bitches. Send it, Josette said. The signalman on the starboard side flashed the message to the command tent. Burnett went forward to look, but soon wished he hadn't. When he heard columns of division, he imagined a formation akin to a column march. But these columns were something else entirely. The front of each was made up of something like 200 musketmen, arrayed in a battle line that was three men deep and about 60 across. Following 50 paces behind them was another line of the same form and complement, and 50 paces behind that, another line, and then another and another, until each column resembled the rungs of a ladder, if the rungs of a ladder bristled with muskets. He counted the number of rungs in each column. The smallest had fifteen. He couldn't say how many the largest had, for he lost count at thirty. The damn thing was half a mile long, and at the back the individual lines blurred together in the morning haze. And all at once, they were on the move marching smoothly out onto the battlefield. When the front ranks were past the Grand Battery, a screen of loosely spaced men spread out in front of them, while a similar screen of riflemen left the Guardian lines and ventured into the field to meet them. These skirmishers, Guardian and Vin, moved with none of the coordinated precision of the columns. Once they closed in and came within range of each other in the middle of the field, Every skirmisher sought cover independently. They traded shots, but the action was too far away for Burnett to make much sense of. Who's winning? he finally asked, when Josette joined him to observe from the rail. Given the numbers involved, I imagine they are, she said quietly. 
It wasn't long before she was proved right. The Guardian skirmishers were pushed back, and farther back, until they reached the clear ground in front of the stream. From there, they ran back to their own line, each one stopping once along the way to kneel and fire off a hasty shot, as if to inform the enemy that this was a withdrawal, but certainly not a retreat. Whatever it might have been, many fewer men crossed the stream coming back than had crossed it going out, and the Vin skirmishers were close on their heels. Rifles to the forward rail, Josette said as they came within range. As a loader handed a rifle to Burnett, he heard a twang near his feet and looked down to see the frayed edges of a bullet hole. Josette was already kneeling behind the rail, so he joined her. Forget they can shoot back, she asked. He had, actually. He scooted along the rail and glanced over to take a shot. The Vin skirmishers had advanced to near 200 paces from the Garnian line and were pelting it from outside effective musket range. Yet muskets suddenly crackled in uncoordinated fire from several places on the line. God damn it, Josette shouted. Signal those idiots to cease fire. Burnett looked out at the Vince skirmishers to see the effect of the musketry. Despite thousands of balls loosed on the enemy, hardly a man among the Vince skirmishers was hit. On the other side of the field, the Vin airship was already flashing signals, no doubt reporting which sections of the Garnian line had fired and thereby identifying the points where the defenders were the least experienced and most poorly disciplined. Can we reposition the weak units to spread them out along the line? Burnett asked, trying to look on the bright side. Josette only stared over the rail and said in a hushed tone, Not before that gets here. A rolling thunderclap punctuated her words. Burnett looked out past the Vin columns to their grand battery, which was now invisible behind a spreading, impenetrable cloud of smoke. Dozens of cannonballs split the air below. They struck the line, streaking over or tearing through the diminished earthen wall to cut men down by ones and twos and send them flying back, often in pieces. Burnett heard a crash above him and looked up to see a ball tear a furrow down Mistral's keel, snapping struts and sending splinters in every direction as it plowed through to exit just behind the hurricane deck. Another ball hit on the starboard side, the whistle of its passage, becoming an unnerving high-pitched squeal as it tore through three Luftgas bags. And the volley wasn't even over, for now the howitzer's shell shot arrived. As the shells exploded, Burnett was not ashamed to cower between the two breath guns, as most of the deck crew was doing the same. Even the steersmen had ducked down, squeezing as much of their bodies as possible behind the scanty protection of the wheels. Under the circumstances, can we not move? Burnett shouted over the booming of the shells. Josette returned a grave look and called up the companionway. Get chips to work on these girders. I'd rather my ship didn't snap in half. Blood was running from a wound on her forehead. She noticed Burnett's eyes on it and, as she reached up to pull a splinter out, said to him, It's shaping up to be a hot day, Bernie. Chips sawed a plank on the catwalk above and ahead of Josette, sending a fine sprinkling of sawdust into her face. It was not the most irritating thing about standing in the open during an artillery bombardment, but after the deadly metal fragments flying in every direction... The sawdust was a close second. Third was the goddamn music. The Garnian National Anthem floated up from a regimental band somewhere below, mingling discordantly with Patriot's March, which was being played by another regiment's band farther along the line. Josette didn't know how well these regiments would do in a fight, but she hoped to God they fought better than they played the fife. A cannonball shrieked past below, cutting the national anthem short with the sound of a shattered snare drum. The melody was replaced by sounds of agony, and she reflected that the music had not been so bad after all. A peppering of rifle bullets hit the hurricane deck. A bullet hole opened in the wicker, not a yard from Josette's place on the deck. The gun crews sheltered in the shadows of their cannons, and were rewarded for their prudence when a ball that might have struck one of them skipped off the port breath gun instead, leaving the barrel ringing like a bell. 
Most shots missed the deck entirely and spent themselves in trivial damage to the bags and envelope. Cruising behind the line at an altitude of 900 feet, the crew members on Mistral's hurricane deck were a long shot for even a skilled rifleman. Thank God Fearon hadn't thought to specify the altitude they were to hold station at, and had merely ordered them to remain below the clouds. Which consoled Josette only a little as she stepped to the rail into plain view of the Vince skirmishers and looked out on the battlefield. She knew the situation was bad and thought herself prepared, but the sight still staggered her. The Vin artillery, concentrating its fire on the weakest sector of the Garnian right flank, had torn bloody swaths through the line. In places, there were only enough men left to make a single rank, where there should have been three. In a few spots, there was no line at all, only craters and corpses. The reserve companies, who should have been plugging holes in the line, were instead of huddled in the rear. In the chaos, perhaps no one had ordered them forward, or perhaps they simply refused to advance into that smoking hell. A thousand paces away, the six Vinzalian columns marched on as if powered by clockwork. She saw a well-aimed Garnian cannonball tear through a file of men, but the files on either side stepped in to fill the gap taking the place of the dead without orders or hesitation. Her eyes flitted across the color guards dotted down the middle of each column, their regimental flags hanging limp in the light airs. By drawing a mental line from one flag to the next and extending it until it intersected the Garnian line, she could see where each column would deploy. As she suspected, one or two aimed to keep the left flank occupied, while the rest would attack the right flank, where the Vin artillery was already eviscerating the weakest parts of the Garnian line. A bullet hit the rail near Josette, snapping her away from her thoughts. She pulled paper and a short stub of pencil from her jacket pocket, and began sketching the enemy disposition. Good God, Burnett said. He'd come up from behind and was now staring at the carnage below. It isn't as bad as it looks, she said, even though it was exactly as bad as it looked. Our gun batteries are still firing. And that at least was true. The Garnian cannons were in decent shape, dug in amid their little bastions all along the line. But they could not answer the concentrated fury of the Vin's grand battery. For each Garnian battery was an island unto itself. Two to four guns projecting slightly ahead of the line, and they could not easily coordinate their fire with the other batteries. She finished sketching the enemy's disposition and discreetly wrote a note in the corner that read, Right flank will break at first contact with the enemy. She underlined the note and placed the sketch into a tin cylinder with a red streamer attached, which she then dropped over the side. Within a few minutes, an ensign on horseback came along, fetched it, and galloped back to the command tent. Ten minutes after that, the command tent signal lamp began to flash. Orders coming in, the starboard signalman said, then winced as a shell exploded off the bow. Blimps will take up picket positions, Scout will take up relay position, Chaucers will support the right flank, Mistral in vanguard. The signalman looked despondent. Why us again? Josette ignored the lament. Acknowledge the message. Send up a green flare, and when Ibis breaks cloud cover, relay our orders. Ibis appeared below the clouds and received the orders. After her acknowledging flash, there came an additional message which read, How are you holding up, Joe? Signal Ibis. You'll know too well shortly. The signal was sent, and true to prediction, Ibis came under fire soon after. Ibis signaled each ship its orders as they broke cloud cover. The three chasseurs proceeded to the weak right flank, Mistral foremost, to add the pitiful fire of their breath guns to it. Grouse, the scout ship, was ordered to the relative safety of the rear, where it would take over for Mistral as signal ship. The unweatherly blimps broke cloud cover last of all, and farthest from their proper stations, and upon receiving their orders, went forward to screen the Chaucers. 
They hadn't been given this job because they were the most capable, Josette knew, but because they were the most expendable. Their only mission was to warn of approaching Vin airships, by signal flare if practical, and by exploding under enemy fire if otherwise. The little swamp hen struggled along on Mistral's port side, and Josette was tempted to move her ship farther away from it, in case a lucky shell set off its inflammable air. The blimp had no keel, only a gondola slung twenty feet below the bag, to keep a wide space between the bag and the boiler fire. On the prow of the blimp's gondola stood her captain, a fresh-faced junior lieutenant. His feet were on the rail, and he leaned forward over the abyss, holding a martingale with one hand. When he saw Josette watching him, he saluted with the other. Josette put her heels together and returned the salute. Swamp Hen's captain gave her a toothy grin that invited no sympathy or pathos, but only reflected an unrelenting commitment to this grim job that some poor bastard had to do. Steersman, fall in ahead of Swamp Hen, Josette ordered. Uh, Captain? Lupien asked, eyeing the explosive little blimp. How far ahead? Directly ahead, if you please. She noticed the trepidation in the deck crew. She lifted her voice to address them collectively. Make no mistake, men, it's guts and glory from here on out. Anyone who doesn't like it is free to get off now. This elicited only a few polite chuckles, but the words did their work, steadying the crew. When the squadron came within range of the columns, Swamp Hand split off and rose into the clouds, while Mistral and the other chasseurs took their new stations. Josette ordered, Riflemen to the starboard rail, rough guns, commence firing. Kemper pulled the lanyard and the cannon spat its round shot into one of the center columns, slicing down a file of men, hitting the first in the head, the second in the shoulders, and the next in their guts. Kemper fired the other gun to lesser but still brutal effect. The column's foremost divisions chose to return the favor, firing a volley that must have numbered in the thousands of muskets. Mistral's envelope fluttered with the impact of the bullets, most of which failed to penetrate even as far as the lift gas bags, their sting much reduced by 900 vertical feet. Josette leapt as one hit the deck under her foot. God damn it, she shouted, hopping to the companionway and sitting down. Burnett and a signalman ran to help, but she waved them away. A keening shriek came from the stern, drawing all eyes. Jute shouted down the companionway. Private Davis is hit, sir! How bad? Josette asked, rubbing her foot. Not mortal, sir, Jute said. He hesitated. Didn't even get through his clothes. He'll be back on his feet in a few minutes. But in the meantime, if you need someone to sing soprano... On the deck, every man winced in sympathetic pain. The Vin officers marched apart from their men, making them easy prey for Burnett. After firing six shots, he thought he'd killed a major and wounded a captain, and he could have kept it up if he hadn't run out of loaded weapons. As he helped reload, the drums drew his attention out to the columns. Those damned columns were endless. He could shoot officers all day long, and there would still be plenty left. As he watched, round shot from a Guardian cannon tore a swath through the column nearest Mistral, killing three men outright and knocking more off their feet from the concussion. And now the columns had drawn near enough for the Garnian howitzers to blast them with canister. Burnett saw a canister shot that must have killed twenty men at once, cutting through three ranks as easily as a scythe cut winked. But the column didn't stop, didn't even slow down. The file stepped in to close the gap, and the ranks behind stepped briskly over the bodies of their comrades. In seconds, the column was as firm as ever, and marching on to the beat of the drums. Mistral's breath guns now coughed their own canister shot, adding to the butchery. To starboard, Ibis fired her two guns, and further on, Lapwing did the same with her one. But the holes in the columns filled in with men as soon as they were made. There were always more men. Vins were dying by the score, but the bastards kept marching into fire, so cool they might have been on parade. Burnett finished loading and raised the rifle to his shoulder, searching for a target. The spacing of the columns tightened up now, 
until the rungs were only a few paces apart. It was harder to spot the officers in that tangle of soldiers, but he saw a sergeant marching apart from the column. As he took aim, a shell went off above, and fragments tore through the envelope. He heard a scream from the keel. Gripped by a now familiar desperation that goaded him into firing a shot, any shot, before it was too late, he fired hastily at the sergeant. He knew he'd missed. God damn it, he muttered, and set to reloading. Calmly, Josette said, stepping up behind him. She looked over the rail and nearly lost her own composure. Oh, hell. Kember and Burnett both looked at her. Oh, hell, she cried again. Signal relay ship. Columns on our right flank are not deploying into firing lines. Anticipate immediate bayonet charge. Keep repeating that until they acknowledge. Burnett swallowed, wet his lips nervously, and said, I had a thought that open field bayonet charges were not quite the thing these days. I don't suppose you might be mistaken. She shook her head. No, they're in a hurry, the cocky bastards, so they'll just tighten up their formations and charge straight in. They think our line is too ragged and undisciplined to stand up to a mass charge, and they have the proof in front of them. There was another scream from above, and Burnett heard a saw grating on bone. Who was hit? Josette just looked at the columns and said, Concentrate on reloading. The breath guns fired, and she turned around. Reverse air screws, left rudder, keep us in front of the column. Burnett tried to concentrate on loading his rifle, but the sight below had a magnetic pull on his eyes. The front line of the Vin advance had reached the edge of the clearing where the killing field was prepared for them, but the columns themselves were still so deep that it seemed impossible for the narrow, fractured Garnian line to hold against them. As the Vins entered the clearing, the Garnians unleashed a ragged musket volley. The columns' front ranks hesitated, and their advance was checked, but for seconds only. The Vin formation had closed up even tighter in anticipation of the coming charge, and the next line of three ranks was only a few paces behind. That second line closed the gap and pushed against the first line. Then the third line pushed against the second. And in the end, the hesitant men in the front had no choice but to advance or be trampled. Some of them returned fire, but they had to shoot on the move for the column advanced like a single beast. It was a monster made of men, possessing the sum of their rage, but hardly any of their fear. And now it broke into a run, screaming with thousands of voices as it charged toward that thin line of Garnian defenders. Josette raised her voice. This is the moment of truth, everyone! Give our boys on the line a cheer! On the deck and along the keel, the crew of the Mistral shouted together in a whooping battle cry. Better than that! Jutes added. Shout, or I will make you shout, I swear to God! Airmen strained their lungs to be heard from so high above to outshout the steam jack and the cacophony of battle. For all their effort, Burnett could hardly imagine the cheer arriving at the ears below as more than a faint yowl, and yet it seemed to buoy the spirits of the defenders, for they returned it with gusto. Burnett had his rifle loaded now and was seeking targets in the columns when their front ranks hesitated again. He looked down to see a Garnian reserve regiment, its courage bolstered perhaps by the airship above it, dash into the line and fill the gaps. A band began to play the Garnian national anthem, which Burnett had never before cared for, but which now roused pride and steel in his heart. The reinforced Garnian line fired a volley, and under that withering fire the crisp cohesion of the Vin columns showed the first sign of wavering. As men fell, those behind had to slow to step over them. But the effect was not equal across the fronts of the columns. Where the casualties were few, the men ran on, as fast as the boot-sucking mud would allow. Where the casualties were high, the men behind were brought to a standstill as they picked their way across the tangled mass of the dead. Men who found themselves ahead of their comrades instinctively veered in the direction of their regimental standards, and so turned their neatly dressed ranks into a disordered blob. But even in disorder, the columns advanced. Quick or slow, they marched together, across the killing ground, with their sergeants and corporals prodding them back into formation on the move. 
the most advanced column reached the stream, and only had to charge through the water and smoke to break the Garnian line. But the front ranks stopped at the water's edge, as if confused by it, and in that moment, the Garnians unleashed another devastating volley. Even through obscuring smoke, the range was under ten yards, and it could hardly miss. The column's front ranks were flayed alive. The men who stepped up to replace them did not march on, but stopped to aim their muskets and return fire. Bernat saw the sergeant he'd missed earlier, screaming and pushing at his men from behind, urging them to charge. He took careful aim at the screaming man, steadied himself, and fired. This time, there was nothing to distract him, for the Vin guns had shifted their fire to avoid hitting their own columns. The smoke cleared to reveal the sergeant alive, but crawling through the mud and leaving blood behind him. His men, who'd advanced only a few paces under his coaxing, now stopped midstream to reload. They were jostled by the men behind, but fear had rippled back through the ranks, and the attack stalled in open ground. The Garnian batteries made them pay for it, pouring hot iron and lead into their flanks. The small artillery batteries spread out along the line in a manner that until now had struck Burnett as inefficient, were now perfectly positioned to fire slantwise into the columns. Canister and round shot, fired at point-blank range, tore furrows across the Venzalian ranks. Yet the sight did not give him hope, for the column could stand amidst this punishment for a quarter of an hour and still have enough men left to overpower the Guardian line, if they only charged across the few remaining yards. So why didn't they charge? If they only charged, the cannons couldn't fire on them, and the volleys would stop, and the clash of cold steel would send the Garnians running. In a charge, they would find not just victory, but safety. But they only stood there, paralyzed by fear. Break, Josette said. Break, you bastards. Break. And they broke. It started in the column's rearmost ranks which had taken the most punishment from the brisk Garnian cannon fire. For a time, the surviving sergeants had pushed all the harder, urging their men forward. But now, even they seemed to despair of ever advancing out of this hellscape. And if the column was not to advance, where was there to go? But back. So they stopped pushing. And when the men felt the pressure on their backs ease, they looked back to see their once stalwart sergeants contemplating retreat. They gave up hope and decided the matter for themselves. The route moved forward to the column in a wave. Only one column had broken, and it was the smallest one at that. But to see even the least of these unstoppable beasts running away was enough to raise a victory cry aboard the airships. The enthusiasm spread to the defenders on the ground, who surely couldn't see a damn thing through the smoke, but who knew from the cheering above them that something had changed. Ibis flashed a report to the command tent, and another message came back. Burnett didn't know what it was, but the men below fired one more volley before fixing bayonets. The defenders, not just inspired but ebullient, splashed forward through the stream. As they emerged from the smoke of their last volley, every Vin column but one broke. Burnett stared in disbelief. It didn't seem possible that this pathetic thin line of guardians could charge at the unstoppable columns, much less send them running. The single remaining Vin column delivered a devastating volley of its own and stood firm to receive the charge. But as the Garnians wrapped around the column and hit it from the flanks, and the airships concentrated all their fire on it, even this last, most courageous formation turned to flee the field. They'd done it. God damn it, they'd done it. The rifleman next to Burnett grabbed him by the sides of the head, bellowed a triumphant whoop, and kissed him squarely on the mouth. Some of the gun crew were dancing a little jig between their still steaming cannons. Another was twirling a rammer over his head, hitting every man within arm's reach. Josette's voice cut through the celebration. Steam jack to emergency power! Elevators up full! Burnett looked forward. With the columns retreating, the Vin Grand Battery had renewed its fire. The first of the round shots shrieked past below. 
they were coming back. Despite their losses, the Vin still outnumbered the Garnians by a wide margin. Their infantry was shaken, yes, but their fears would calm and they would be sent back out, reinforced and more determined than ever. And when they came back again, they'd take the time to deploy properly, and they'd advance with Vin airships over their heads. The Vins hadn't risked their fragile, expensive ships in the first assault when they were confident of an easy victory, but this time would be different. She scanned the cloud ceiling with her spyglass, looking for signs of them. Sir, can't we ascend into cloud cover? Kimber asked, her voice a whisper. The ensign was just coming down the companionway ladder. Their orders said otherwise. I believe I asked for a damage report, ensign, not advice. Yes, sir, Kimber said, swallowing. That last shell cut a piece out of the steam jack housing, but it's still spinning. There are slow leaks in several of the bags, probably from musket balls, but the riggers haven't found all the holes. And, sir, it looks like Private Chase will live. Chips is getting pretty good with legs. But, um, Private Allard was bleeding out so fast when I saw him. I think he's, uh, probably gone by now, sir. And there are plenty of minor wounds to go around. Thank you, Ensign. Ibis signaling, a crewman at the rail said. We're to come alongside her and receive relayed orders. They maneuvered alongside and Captain Emery looked across the gap, his expression dark. He called through a speaking trumpet. Doing all right. We're holding together, sir, Josette called back. But I'm worried they'll throw their chasseurs into the next attack. Emery nodded. To bomb our cannon batteries, I expect. The cannons are all that stopped the bastards last time. If they can knock a few batteries out from the air, or even just tie them up. He trailed off, with a speaking trumpet still at his mouth. I'd like to take Mistral forward to join the picket, sir. It was what Emery had been about to tell her anyway. She just saved him the trouble of working up to it. Granted, he said, and I'll send Lapwing to keep you company. Thank you, sir, she saluted. Emery returned the salute. Good hunting!